Hello everyone and welcome back to the Stormblood Dungeon Lore series. In these videos I'll do my best to explain the lore behind each dungeon of Final Fantasy XIV and go over some things about them that you might not know. Today's dungeon is Alamigo. The proud city-state of Alamigo once stood tall, built against the very mountains themselves as a towering citadel rife with defences and lookouts. Its vast coverage of the lands surrounding the locks was such that Alamigo held full control over the road networks connecting the Shroud to other parts of the land, north of Girabanya. After the fall of the King of Ruin, Theodoric, the Alamegan resistance was at the time in a state of utmost jubilation at their cleansing of the corrupt nature of its country's royalty. Their ecstasy would not last long however, as not long after the forces of Garlemald's 14th Legion would sweep in from on high, armed to the teeth with the newest Magitate machines and with the notorious Gaius Van Belsar at the helm. They tore through the somewhat unguarded state of the resistance, resulting in the Alamegans trading one tyrant for the next. The lands leading up to the Shroud were taken too by the Garleans, and even the Shroud was barred from view by Belsar's wall. Now at the palace, with Van Belsar missing for some time, the Crown Prince Xenos Yegalvis resides within, his empty gaze looming over the resistance as they fight back against his own legion. The resistance however has fought back harder than ever with the backing of the Second Eorzean Alliance, and they now stand at Xenos' doorstep having just secured entry to the locks, with the massive citadel now in sight across the shores and hills of the open region. Planning immediately goes into effect to find a way inside the walls of the outer citadel, with Whiskar, the young man we met long ago in the peaks, stepping forward to inform us of a well once used by his grandfather that drew its waters from the locks. After investigating a nearby village and triggering an imperial alarm, the time is against the Warrior of Light to speed towards a monastery to the south before the majority of the nearby forces become aware of our presence. As we reach the archway leading to the monastery, we see a huge colossus powered by two nearby Magitate generators defending the entrance. Disabling the generators first before tackling the giant, we manage to clear the area of the Imperials and find Whiskar's grandfather hiding in the cellar from the troops. Retrieving the key, we immediately head to a nearby lock to attempt to swim through the watery route leading inside the walls. Before diving, Rionje gives us a device hoping to counter Fordola's as yet unknown strength. With Lee and Thancred at our side, we infiltrate into the streets of the Citadel, Thancred incapacitating any sentries along the way. After opening the gates for the Alliance forces, we turn and reach the Resonatorium, where encountering Fordola once more. Using the etheric siphon from Rionje, we slow her movements enough to defeat her and rescue Kryle, but not before the Imperial traitor shouts about Xenos' untold power. After returning to Porta Praetoria, a plan finally moves into action to lay siege to the gates of Alamigo to force an opening into the city proper. After rendezvousing with Pippin and delivering one of Roban's swords as a sign of his trust in the young Lalafell, we hear a troop of Doman soldiers marching under Imperial colours. Alphano and the Warrior of Light head them off, but after failing to convince them diplomatically of their homeland's freedom, we prove our mettle by force, eventually convincing their leader, Hakuro, of our strength, and he believes our story at last. Finally, the siege on the gates begins, with cannons raining hellfire upon the walls of the heavy gate, and the Thaumaturges using fire and ice both to melt and crack the metal apart. When Imperial defences fly in, we hear a screech from above and see Hien and his Doman followers upon many Yol, all of which begin a dogfight with the Imperials to take them down. The cannons finally manage to make a big enough dent in the gates, and we once more meet with our allies below the stairway leading to them. Raban volunteers his sword this time, as well as Lise and Arenvold, all eager to see the fight to its end. Alphano of course offers his own services as a scion, hoping to delve deep into the royal palace to confront Xenos, and to free El Amigo from his clutches once and for all. Just inside the gates we begin our ascent to the palace, proceeding through a deserted marketplace surrounded by Garlean banners and barricades. As we head towards Xenos' location, we are met by the station troops desperately defending their last bastion, charging down the stairs to meet us. Along the way we can spot our allies beyond some barricades fighting other Imperial soldiers and Magitek machines, and we eventually reach a roadblock in the form of a taller barricade blocking our path. After dealing with the troops inbound from the other side, 
the Maelstrom soldiers help blast the wall aside to allow us to pass. Up ahead, the Serpents along with Kane Senna fight on, and along the next road we are assaulted by two of the Rhoda Magitate machines seen within Castrum Rabania. They charge at the party while troops from a second barricade at the end of the road charge over the ramps to attack. After tackling the Rhodas and the troops, a Doman Shinobi lands on the far wall and throws another explosive to clear the way, warning us of the Magitech Scorpion just around the bend. We turn the corner and spot said Scorpion, awaiting us just outside of Rauga's gate. As with most Magitech creations, the Scorpion is armed to the teeth with explosives and ballistics and attempts to destroy the party. Its electromagnetic field sends a pulse across the ground, damaging the party, and shortly into the encounter, it begins attempting to lock onto its targets. Focusing on two allies, it prepares to launch a missile to land upon its targeting reticule, but moving around enough can throw the aim of the machine off to avoid them. After this it fires a second set of targeted attacks on everybody, but simultaneously begins using its tail and forearm guns alongside them. Blasting heavily in front and behind itself, the attack slowly whittles away any standing in its range of fire. After surviving another electromagnetic field and evading its missiles, the scorpion tumbles to the ground and the large gate ahead of us opens. As we head into the royal palace outskirts, Emmerich leads a troop of Ishgardian soldiers alongside us, charging into the place. In the palace gardens we follow the pathway along, being attacked by more defenders as we go. The Magitech Avengers swing heavily at the tanking party member, and we can spot Lucia fighting just outside one of the barricades. A gate opens as we draw close and more troops head us off, surprised at our triumph over the Scorpion. As we defeat them and head into the open part of the area, a large amount of Canis attack from behind the huge statue, along with the Magitech cannons circling the room firing upon us. As we tackle the Canis, however, our allies get the better of the troops manning the cannons and disable them. On the far side of the room we come up to the last two active cannons, fighting off the troops attacking the Ishgardian allies there, and the knight uses the last active cannon to blast through the gate and allow us into the Chamber of Knowledge, where we finally come face to face with Aulus Mal Asina himself. Although the man himself is quite weak, he unleashes more Magitech machines upon the party, launching bits all around to expel pulses of energy to damage the group. When injured, however, he rushes to the centre of the room and uses a Magitech Disruptor, stunning the group. With a Mind Jack, he manages to expel the party's souls from their bodies, pushing them away and seizing control of their corporeal forms. However, with such strong souls, the group can literally return themselves to their bodies and retaliate against all us. The scientist comments on the scale of the data gained from this experiment, and continues attacking the group. Noticeably, Aulus seems to be in control of some form of power close to magic, as he expels a burst of mana from himself as well as using demi-magics to assault the party individually. After avoiding the bits once more, the party brings him low and the door behind the room slides open, leading to the final ascent in the palace proper. Immediately, another set of troops attacks the party, coupled with a handful of apparent thaumaturges unleashing magic from a safe spot on the platform above the party. To the right we can see both Hien and Yugiri now fighting on against the troops, and on our left a Magitech laser field blocks our path. Destroying its structure and defeating the troops, we move on and spot Pippin along with some of the immortal flames now against half a dozen Imperials. Rounding the next corner, the party is attacked by several Magitech slashes and the large hexadrone as we head through the Guardian armory set up within the palace. Turning back to the central room, a final group of soldiers begin attacking the party with all their might, but we can see that our allies are pushed up onto the central platform, with Hien and Yugiri once again fighting the Imperials stationed there. After we pass another laser field, we reach the antechamber to the throne room, where a final two Magitech Colossi stand guard. After managing to take them both down, the door to the throne room opens, where we at last come to face the crown prince in his own castle. Sat upon the throne, Xenos gives an odd smile as we enter and approaches us, drawing Ame no Habakiri from his Magitech sheath as we prepare to fight him for hopefully the final time. Apparently expecting us, Xenos attacks and immediately creates a perimeter of Dark Aether using his blade. During this battle, he uses the three swords in his sheath to perform different styles of attacks based on the blade chosen. The Art of the Storm unleashes a wave of electricity around himself as he swings, paralyzing any too close to the slice. 
The art of the swell, meanwhile, swings the blade with such force that it pushes the party back, forcing them to stay close and be knocked into the dangerous blood red ether. Finally, Ame no Habakiri unleashes the art of the sword, slicing every party member in a line from where Xenos stands. Between these, he heavily swipes at the tanking party member with an unmoving troika, and also uses his concentrativity to burst the floor around the room. When injured, he summons several shades of himself, each unleashing a vein splitter where they stand, after which he focuses the blade on a single ally. After a time, he prepares a huge cleave on them, but because his attention is so focused, the targeted ally can directly attack away from the rest of the group. After a second round of his abilities, near to his defeat, Xenos becomes untouchable in the centre of the room and begins absorbing ether from the surrounding area. Using his swords as a channeling device, they each unleash their own abilities as we attempt to attack and break the flow of ether heading to Xenos. Finally, after managing to overwhelm all the blades, Xenos unleashes each of their strength in turn, coming down on the party with a huge burst of ether. After this, we finally push Xenos back and force him to one knee, only for him to regain his footing and jump back towards the throne. Afterwards, Xenos begins speaking of his experiences with us, how he was disappointed in the first encounter at Rauga's Reach, but now we stand before him as an equal foe, as tenacious and ferocious as himself. He can see by the look in our eye the desire to go for the throat and deal him a fatal blow, and declares that the heavens must be witness to the duel, turning to exit to the royal menagerie. At that moment, another reserve of Imperial troops arrive, and the Warrior of Light proceeds alone to face Xenos, leaving their allies to deal with the soldiers. After heading out, we finally discover the whereabouts of the missing primal Shinru, bound within a Magitek cage atop the Royal Menagerie. Xenos talks about the worm, describing how it yearns only for violence thanks to Ilbid's wish for a creature to destroy the Empire. He poses the question of what we might do should he step aside, leaving the Warrior of Light to wonder if they would kill or bind the primal. In any case, Xenos speaks of the limits of the Echo and how Van Belsal's research showed him the potential of it all. He mentions this philosophy of destroying every icon as they are a plague upon the world, and notes that instead of this, man should be free to fight for the pure joy and ecstasy that comes with it. Giving a maniacal grin, he insists that he and the Warrior of Light are one and the same, eventually going on to cast aside any meaning of Alamigo, Doma or Garlem or the like. He swings his blade, cutting the generator power in the binding cage, and Shimru gives a great roar after being freed. As it does so, Xenos triumphantly states that no icon can stand worthy before the Resonant, activating the same power as Fordola as he begins to merge with the beast. Absorbing his body into that of the Great Worm, it speaks in his voice, roaring and taking flight to a far-off platform for a final battle. The fight atop the platform is an arduous and chaotic one, with Shimri unleashing the power of all of the elemental primals we faced in our journeys, clearly showing the unending levels of ether the beast possesses. After a hard-fought battle avoiding some of the primals' most dangerous abilities, the beast roars and traps the group inside Magic's chains, forcing them to break free as it charges from below, breaking the platform and knocking any still trap to their doom. Atop this final stage, the platform slowly begins to crumble under the weight of Shimri's abilities, but after managing to fend off its tail and avoid its mighty wings and fists, we overcome the beast and it descends back to the ground. Although Xenos manages to stand after he falls back to the Royal Menagerie, our allies arrive, and after mourning his defeat and acknowledging that his life would have no further meaning past the feeling of joy he felt against us, the Crown Prince soon takes his own life, falling to the ground and signalling the liberation of Alamigo once and for all. And that's the end of the story and lore for Alamigo. With Xenos now gone, the Twelfth Legion is as good as defeated, and our allies come together to sing and listen to the Alamegan anthem sung in its streets once more. With Lisa at the helm, she raises a hand as the flag waves behind her, fulfilling her wish to Papalimo and Ida all at once. Although some time would be needed to repair Alamigo to its previous condition, those that live in Girabania can carry on knowing that they won't be under the thumb of such an oppressor ever again. In a blow to the Scions ranks, however, Lisa now admits that she cannot consider herself part of the group due to her bias and responsibilities to Alamigo, but the rest assure her that she can consider herself a lifelong comrade. Now looking forward, we press on to find out what the future may hold for the regions of Othard, Hingashi, and of course, Girabania. 
I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider liking it and subscribing to the channel for more Final Fantasy XIV lore. It's a way off, but I'd like to try and get to a thousand subscribers before the end of the year as a goal, so if you did enjoy, please consider subbing. In any case, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time for the Drowned City of Scala.